Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our non-clinical careers um, student track session. Um, I'm Kim. I am a master's of public health student. I'll be entering my second year and I'm interning with the Maternal uh, Health Learning Innovation Center for the summer. And thank you to the panelists as well for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, this is a webinar uh, format, and so we won't be able to hear your audio. Um, only the panelists and the other speakers have video and audio options. So if you have any questions, please just put them in the chat. Um, I also have here my teammate, Tamia, who will help me moderate and monitor the chat box. Um, so now I'd ask if the panelists could just introduce themselves, just give us your name, who you are, and what your current role is. Um, does anyone want to go first? I can, I don't mind. Okay. Uh, good, I guess morning, everyone. I, I'm in different time zones than you all, but I still think it's, I think it's still morning. But my name is Rebecca Severin. I'm the maternal health, the North Carolina maternal health maternal health innovation program supervisor. Goodness, couldn't get that out. And so I just thank you all for being here with us. And I'll follow Rebecca. Um, we are part of the same team. I am Ushma Mehta and I also work for the um, Department of Health and Human Services in North Carolina. And I am the epidemiologist for the maternal health innovation grant. Um, I can go. I'm Pauline Sakamoto. I am a nurse with a master's degree. Uh, I'm talking to you from California, San Jose, California. So it's good morning. It's early morning. Um, anyways, my background is I've worked in multiple county and state uh, public health agencies in my past. i um, spent 20, over 20 years as executive director of a nonprofit mother's milk bank. Um, the oldest milk bank in the United States. And uh, I just stepped down as the executive director and now doing some consulting work for the milk banks. And uh, I have a special project that I've just started this year, which is working with the AANHPI, the Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders Collaboration of California, which is quite unique as a member of USBC for over 12 years, we've never had enough people of Asian descent to really have representation. So I'm, I'm excited that we've started this. It's my uh, goal to be able to um, organize our groups, our 83 different languages and, and more than cultures. And uh, hopefully um, you'll start hearing about some of our traditions and our stories. Thank you. I guess that leads me. My name is Darcy. I am based in Maryland, although I am in person with the symposium today in Chicago. So yes, good morning. Still some here. Um, I have a master's of science in medical anthropology and cross-cultural practice from Boston University um, and, and currently the respectful care project coordinator um, for the Alliance for Innovational Maternal Health based out of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, as you can see, we have four great panelists and hopefully you'll be able to learn a little bit about a new career path or just learn something about careers in maternal health in general. Um, on the next slide, I have um, their contact information if you're interested in reaching out. Um, if not, you're also welcome to just email the symposium directly and we can redirect the questions. Um, so I'll begin now with the panel questions. We have about six questions um, and feel free if you have other questions, just put them in the chat and we'll answer them at the end of the session. So to start off, um, I wanted to ask the panelists, what brought you into the field of maternal health and were there defining experiences or events that influenced career choice? Um, does anyone want to go first? Sure, I'll go. Okay. Um, so 
initially in, in my undergrad and in high school, I was really set on um, going into medicine, becoming a doctor, not necessarily because that's what I wanted, but it was very much expected of me. Um, my family is Indian. Um, I'm, I was born there, but came here when I was two. But, um, you know, when I didn't do so well in the MCATs in undergrad, I realized I really don't want to take this again. <laughs> so I joined the Peace Corps um, <laughs> and went to Nepal for two years and three months. Um, had an amazing experience. Um, saw firsthand how important clean water is or just access to water, you know, that's not several miles away. Um, and really was impressed by the strength of the women. But Nepal at that time was one of the very few countries where women died earlier than men. Um, and that really impacted me. I saw how hard they have to work um, just to survive. And childbirth was very difficult. I actually had a neighbor there who um, was in labor all night and we had to go to the nearest hospital which was hours away eventually. I and mean, it's just very difficult. Um, and then that really brought into focus that I, I want to be in public health. So I, after Peace Corps, I went to the University of Arizona and got a um, master's in public health with a focus on international health and women's health. After which I um, got a PhD in nutritional epidemiology with a very like focus on maternal health at UNC, Healing School of Public Health. Thank you, Dr. Osma. I can, I can go next. I, 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 my story is almost similar. Um, my background is public health nursing and a master's degree. And I've done multiple jobs uh, on the ground. My boots were on the ground in the high desert. Uh, I volunteered on weekends uh, to work in public health uh, programs, clinics for the immigrants in, in, uh, from uh, the Hmong and the Cambodian immigrants. We started a clinic. Um, and then I, you know, I kind of wandered uh, from the desert to the capital of California and became a policy developer for the Medi-Cal program. Um, I kind of got into lactation and, and maternal and child health only because um, that's where the roles kind of put me. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed working in that role. And, you know, frankly, my goal was to figure out what in the healthcare industry, where does the initial fix start, right? How do I help the most people. Um, and I felt that public health was it and birthing and, and um, early childhood was, was the most important. And having my own kids um, and struggling with lactation, uh, you know, brought me to this level. And, and, you know, when people ask me, well, I need milk and I'm, I'm struggling with lactation, I can really understand what they're doing and what's going through their minds in that short period of time. It's, it's stressful. Um, and so I, you know, I joined with this nonprofit, um, at the time there were only five milk banks in the United States and the San Jose one was really going to go downhill if someone didn't take it over. So, um, it's been a joy and, um, working there. So I enjoy this and, uh, I do have, um, fond feelings for UNC and, uh, and Kim who joined us in the Asian Pacific Islanders group. Um, so I, uh, I enjoy what I do and, and, uh, and the impact that I've been able to provide. Thank you, Pauline. Would any of the other panelists like to go? I'll go. Um, I, I guess I've always wanted to be a doctor, so I am still on my clinical medical doctor tracking currently applying to medical school right now but um, after undergrad I was exhausted <laughs> I had been um, very scientific um, science heavy program and um, had decided to kind of like shift out of a biology major at some point around my sophomore year and um, ended up taking um, double majoring in um, Vanderbilt's version of public health which was medicine health and society so 
a lot of the social aspects and I was a double major in religious studies. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to um, get a grant as an undergrad to spend a summer in Mali, West Africa, where I got to combine um, my love of the social aspects from my public sub, like sub public health degree in religious studies and did um, a study in a really rural town in Mali on, um, Mali is a 95% Islamic country. And so I did a study on how Islamic traditions impact how medical care was given in the rural town that I was in two hours of, uh, two and a half hours outside of Bamako, the capital, um, and shadowed um, for the entire summer and kind of fell in love with maternal child health there. Um, it was interesting. I remember going to the clinic one day and a woman, um, nine months pregnant who had never received, never received prenatal care, had, um, was in the field with her husband that morning, had realized she was in labor, walked down the hill um, for about three hours, <laughs> showed up at the clinic and gave birth to three perfectly healthy identical triplet boys um, without any prenatal care. So I was thinking, my God, um, and yet here we are in the United States with a maternal health crisis and women just like her dying at incredibly high rates. So what, what's the difference? And so um, when I got back to college, um, my senior year of college, I just kind of just started exploring courses that would kind of explore this and ended up finding um, a program. I said, I kind of want to still learn, but I definitely don't want to go into something scientific heavy. So I started looking at um, MPH programs, but I didn't think it was going to give me exactly what I was looking for. And so I ended up stumbling upon the medical anthropology master's of science program at Boston University. Super small program, four of us graduated together, but we ended up um, part of the program is doing original qualitative research. And I ended up doing my research in Boston on um, experiences, negative experiences of social determinants of health. And I particularly um, did an internship with Medical Legal Partnership Boston um, and kind of adapted. They do a lot of uh, work educating Rhode Island and Massachusetts on experiences of social determinants of health from both the medical and legal perspectives. And so I did a lot of work with them and interviewed um, medical legal partnership affiliates and Black Women Health and Human Services workforce members that had taken an SDOH training through MLPV and kind of just asked them, what do you think was missing from the SDOH discourse? Um, and kind of found this historical perspective was missing, especially in the Boston area when it comes to minority groups that are experiencing negative SDOH. And so wrote a 200 page thesis on that to graduate and then realized Still really don't want to go back to school, would like to actually just go into the workforce for a little bit and make some money, and ended up finding a job. Um, I've always been super passionate about maternal child health. I do want to be an OBGYN someday, so it's kind of like, okay, how do I take my research experience and kind of apply it to the maternal child health focus and ended up getting this job at ACOG. Um, luckily, my background had been in, you know, health equity, and I had taken courses at the law school at BU in reproductive justice and school and classes at the School of Public Health and Health and Human Rights and policy work. And so I found the perfect position here at ACOG um, as the Respectful Care Project Coordinator, and I support the team on our equity journey, including respectful care and our patient safety bundles, looking beyond the intersections of just race and ethnicity, but into gender identity and um, social aspects and demographic work. And so I have had a really, really interesting journey into this space, but every step I've gotten to integrate something more into what I'm learning and how I'm using it. And I can only hope that it'll benefit me in medical school. Um, in the future and as a doctor, so. Thank you, Garcy. Perfect, so I think I'm, I, I rounded out, don't I? So yeah. to remind everyone, um, my name is Rebecca Severin. I think I heard a couple of uh, uh, points in, from the other panelists that kind of aligned the same way with my own experience. So I also had the interest of becoming a medical doctor, specifically OBGYN. That was a one track mind, you know, when I first entered college at University of North Florida in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and, you know, my undergrad was in biology and it wasn't jiving for me. So enjoyed biology, but it was really um, in my school, kind of a pass through, right? So nobody was becoming a biologist. Everybody wanted to use that as a way to get to medical school. Um, and so the more classes I took, the more I realized that this wasn't really for me. And I didn't know what I wanted to do until I took a epidemiology class, Epi 101, in as a, I decided on a minor in public health, didn't really know what it was, but I was like, okay, it's got the word health in it. I'm going with it. Um, and I absolutely fell in love with it, the first class. And so um, at the time I had already started working in the field. I worked in with children. 
um, that were in the foster care system in some way or the other. And so my kind of backdoor into maternal and child health was, um, you know, in, in this intersection between public health and social services. And so I had uh, decided to stay with my alma mater and get my master's of public health and community health. Um, at the same time, I was working as a child protective investigator with the state of Florida in Duval mm -hmm. County, which is one of the most urban counties in Florida. And it was life-changing um, at that point of being able to see the ways in which I was a part of a intervention body, all right, that that was involved in families' lives when things have gone the worst way. Mm -hmm. And having this, getting public health education at the same time, I realized I always want to be on the prevention side. I always want to be engaging families before they are in front of a court system or in front of a, 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 a in the hospital fighting for their children's lives and things like that. So um, I made, I finished my master's in public health and I made a um, career choice to change to home visiting. Um, so I started working at the, a, um, so Florida has um, Healthy Families Florida, which is a affiliate or accredited affiliation with Healthy Families America, which is a child abuse prevention program. So um, that was actually the first time that I saw Masters of Public Health being a requirement to run a program. I was like, oh, I've got this. <laughs> I have all this education. Um, and it was, again, life-changing for me. I ran a program or st started a program in very rural counties east of Tallahassee, so about a five-county area mm -hmm. where it came to light a lot of the pitfalls in maternal health in the United States, particularly for rural families. Um, we served a very small population of women and birthing people that covered a massive distance. And in all five of those counties, there was not one delivering hospital. Um, we border, if anyone knows about the Florida, Georgia uh, geography, those mm -hmm. counties share a border with Georgia. And there's uh, not continuous, like the continuous counties in Georgia also do not have birthing facility, uh, birthing facilities in all the hospitals, within all the counties. So it really opened my eyes to some of the issues, some of the social determinants of health um, factors that come into play in that life course perspective. And so um, at the same time, I was learning a bit more about my family history and understanding, um, you know, I'm a first generation Haitian American. My parents came to the United States when they were children. My mother had four children and all but one of them had a very traumatic birthing experience. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these influences happening at the same time um, that resulted in me uh, kind of throwing out, casting a net to see where else I could land. And I landed at the North Carolina Division of Public Health currently as the Maternal Health Innovation Program Supervisor. And it aligns completely with what I see by my, the life track that I'm on. Um, and I also, with a colleague of mine, we stood up a reproductive justice consulting firm called RJ, RJ Squared, and it also aligned everything. So it just was that kind of moment of alignment, but really I didn't get that so much on the education side, but just in the field working with families. Thank you all for sharing your stories and how you ended up in maternal health. It seems like everyone started at a certain point at the same in the same area and then somehow diverged and all now ended up in maternal health. So thank you again. So along with that, I wanted to ask how have your personal experiences, whether that's your experience with your culture, your race, community, um, or other identities, how that has influenced your professional career or if it has influenced your professional career. I know I, oh, go ahead. go ahead, Rebecca. Okay, no problem. I know I just yeah, finished talking, <laughs> but I, I think I touched on it a little bit when I talked about the experiences of my mom and her uh, uh, traumatic experiences with giving birth in um, South Florida for all four of her children. Like I said, only one child, she did not have an adverse, adverse birth experience. Um, she was 19 years old and preeclamptic and alone with just my dad. Um, without any support at the bedside. Mm -hmm. um, and that experience really made her think hard about potentially not having more children because it was just that bad, even though she desired more children. 
Um, and so I, I think of, with a lot of um, uh, cultures across the world, we probably can all, you know, kind of share in this common experience of our parents not necessarily being as open with what they've been through. Um, and so being able to have some of those grown women conversations with my mom and understanding that what, what her experience was really solidified within me some of the other things I had been seeing with Black women of the diaspora and their experience in the United States and other Western countries with giving birth. Um, and so that really got me passionate about the reproductive justice um, uh, framework and that movement. And so that's what kind of led me deeper into maternal health and understanding the ways in which intersectionality comes together to, in, in, in a historical context, uh, uh, affect the outcomes and the quality of life of women and birthing mm -hmm. people. So kind of that's, that's where it came from personally for me. Yeah, I think for me, um, in the Asian population, you know, the, the Asian the communities are pretty um, private and, you know, we don't share that kind of information. So um, being a member of the USBC and um, supporting the African-American groups and the Latinx groups and, you know, scratching my head thinking, well, gosh, you know, out of 500 people at the meeting at the USBC, I'm the lone Asian-American. What's with that, right? Couldn't figure that out. And yet the data that the USBC, or I'm sorry, about CDC shows that the Asian population is so high and so progressive in breastfeeding but yet, um, you know, we know pockets of Chinese Americans and um, Pacific Islanders locally in the, in the Bay Area whose breastfeeding rates are so, and mortality and morbidity rates are extremely poor um, in the U.S. So why is there such a difference, you know, with the, the data that's being collected and um, what's happening um, that we see boots on the ground? And so... Um, it really intrigues me. Uh, it, we just started this year. It intrigues me why this data is so conflicted and why aren't these uh, women given the opportunity to have uh, maternal um, and child health care um, that can be afforded to them, but they're just not seeking it. So that's my, my thing. I, I really, uh, it's interesting to me at my old age that uh, I'm taking on this new you know, process and new interest. Pauline, um, I will be reaching out to you. I'm really interested in, in what you're talking about. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely expect an email from me for sure. Absolutely, love it. <laughs> um, I actually did my dissertation um, on maternal obesity and infant feeding choices. And so, and yes, uh, you know, all women should breastfeed yada, yada, yada. But then I had my baby in while I was working on my dissertation. Um, and then the baby ended up in the NICU for a week. Mm -hmm. And all that stress, my milk wouldn't come in. Um, it was hard. You know, the reality is different. And then you're, you know, I was lucky that I was a PhD student and I didn't get paid for that time, but I took three months to be with my child, but um, it's a struggle. I was lucky I had my husband working a, a full-time job, was able to support, you know, I was lucky. And so my, my mother came for a few months to live with me and to feed me a lot of, uh, you know, what Indian Hindu women make for their mothers to help with milk production and replenish the body and all that. And so I was lucky in so many ways. Um, and that really brought home to me, wow, what, <laughs> what would it be like not to have that, not to have my mom with me to help my husband be able to take time off? Like, um, I don't, I don't understand how we don't support mothers more in this country and why we don't. Um, and, and it's one thing to tell women, everyone should breastfeed, of course, that's ideal, but why are their policies not there to support us to do the things that need to, that we know should be easier to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that really influenced my career choice in that I had my kid, then I was working on my dissertation 
Um, I spent the first three months with him, but then I hardly saw him. I'd come out to breastfeed and then go back in the room and start working on my um, dissertation. And I got burned out uh, with my PhD. So I decided to stay home for a little bit with him. And that turned into actually some months to actually eight years and then working, consulting, um, part-time, that kind of thing on a variety of different projects. Um, some national, some local, um, which I really enjoyed working on. You know, my path was not straight. I decided I did not want to be in academia. Um, it did not appeal to me, the lifestyle. And so I kind of had to find my own way. And I feel like um, whatever you do along your professional career pathway, however it is, you bring all that knowledge with you to the current time, to where you are. And I think it's worthwhile. Okay, I'm I sorry, I was kind of rambling there. <laughs> no, not at all. You're sharing. Uh, I think that leaves me. So uh, personally, like Rebecca, I am from a Haitian Dominican family. Um, and uh, I didn't really have any like personal stories in maternal child health. I grew up pretty relatively isolated and pretty privileged. It was just me and my mother. And um, I didn't really get to a place of like really looking into maternal child health until I got to college. And my interest into like maternal child health and reproductive justice and you know sexual just sex justice was around like what like a lot of people that I was acquainted with and actually really close personal friends were sexually assaulted on college campuses. And so I got involved in like sexual violence advocacy work and do that and then managed to go to Mali, West Africa. And that was kind of where a lot of those things started combining for me and my research project and writing that out and then applying to um, my master's program at BU where I got to do a lot of this work and take classes on it. So I did section reproductive health advocacy courses, program evaluation, like I said, reproductive justice courses and health and human rights. And now I, you know, I do a lot of obviously studying and like the statistics of demographics and, you know, the statistics we always talk about of black women are dying three to four times more than their white counterparts due to pregnancy related complications. And so, um, I started really seeing that in my personal life. I mean, I'm, I'm currently about to turn 26 and a lot of the people that I went to college with are getting married and having kids and telling me their birth stories and whatnot. And um, friends of mine are still getting sexually assaulted. So I actually do like a lot of volunteer work um, as a rape crisis advocate and help be a company, um, uh, accompanying people. So I do a lot of like advocacy work through like sexual violence policy and, um, in my work doing like a lot of respectful care work, trying to involve equity in a lot of these processes and a lot of the policies around this at the system level. Um, how do we make a safe exam less invasive <laughs> for uh, the people that are experiencing sexual assault? How do we uh, take respectful care into consideration for pregnancy-related complications? Um, knowing the statistics, we still have invisible populations like um, AIM populations are invisible when we talk about research in this space. Um, because there's so many tribes and there's, you know, we're not even really talking about the historical perspectives behind all of this. And then we're talking about, you know, inclusive language and broadening our scope. And yet we're not really looking at how LGBTQ families are building their families through reproductive, um, assisted reproductive technologies. What is the maternal care, health care? And we're talking about maternal, right? What are we talking? Is it parental health care? Like the language around this? And when we talk about LGBTQ family building, um, I think we're in a really good place in the last 10 years, and especially with COVID, of really talking about racial and ethnic health disparities, but respectful care and equity goes just beyond that. It's an intersectional discussion. Um, and so I spend a lot of my time doing a lot of that work, offering a lot of discourse around this, and um, that's where my interest lies. And I, I think it's because I've seen so many of the intersectional identities of the people around me experience a lot of this, um, that I spend a lot of time just talking about what the intersections between these are. And my thesis work was around SDOH. So when we talk about social determinants of health, we always talk about it in a present context, but we know that history impacts the present, which impacts future health outcomes. And I did my research in Boston and Boston is the seventh most segregated city in the country, <laughs> right behind Birmingham, Alabama. Surprisingly, you would think in New England and the Northeast, it's not the case, but it very much is. And 
Um, mm. Why are um, why why is the black population experiencing negative health outcomes? Well, you have historical policies in Massachusetts of redlining and forced movement and um, gentrification is now occurring. So it's like almost a cycle, right? And you think history, oh, well, that happened 200 years ago. It's not really a big deal. Boston, Boston Tea Party, they're so progressive. And Boston has all these hospitals, it's academic institutions, it's where Harvard is. Yeah, it's not the case. <laughs> um, and we still need to be talking about these type of things in this area. And so um, that's kind of how I came to this space and I'm still learning. Um, and especially every time I move to a new city and new state, that's more history I need to learn about the neighborhood and the region that I'm in and how has history impacted this? I mean, and it's totally different. I went to college in Nashville, Tennessee, <laughs> and then moved to Boston and was from Connecticut and did a lot of work in New York. And now I live in the DMV. And every time you move somewhere in the country, that's a different history that impacts a different set of sub people and a different set of intersectional identities. And what does that mean for those future health outcomes? And all those places are undergoing a historical present moment now as well, gentrification in urban areas. And so people that, uh, for the last 20, 30, 40 years because I'm living in urban areas and now moving out of the city, which leads to a whole nother cycle of impacts on healthcare and whatnot. And so I think it's an important discussion that's going to literally keep going. It's a cycle. Thank you all for sharing your personal experiences and um, how you connect those to your careers now and the path that you're on. I know personally, as a student myself, it's really interesting for me to hear um, about people who are in the field and how they got there and how their personal affects their professional. And that's very important to highlight. Um, so along with professional, I wanted to ask, um, because all of you are non-clinicians or you work in non-clinical spaces, um, how often do you interact with clinicians and how can you help clinicians work with clinicians to inform policy and practice? I know I just stopped talking, but um, I think for me, that's probably the easiest question. <laughs> I work for the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. We are a member organization of literally clinicians and physicians. Um, although the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health is a complete, we have a completely non-clinical staff, but all the work that we do goes to hospital systems and state teams. Uh, physicians are in, like women's health professionals, whether that's midwives, nurses, or actual OBGYNs, they're implementing the work that we do. Um, and so sitting down into rooms and work groups with different types of um, professionals and clinicians is, you know, a, a pretty a big deal because you have to find ways to, I feel like when we talk at, like in non-clinical spaces, it's almost like, I don't want to say an echo chamber, but you're talking to a lot of people that are, that are looking at clinical evidence and material in a very different way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then when you go to actually communicate that to physicians, it's, it's almost like some, sometimes things get lost in translation because they have a very different mindset. They go to medical school, they're very much enculturated in that medical culture. Things have to be scientifically communicated and whatnot. Um, and so it, it, it sometimes is challenging trying to communicate the social aspects or the, the, the surrounding mm -hmm. context around cl um, clinical evidence and medicine to physicians. But I think the work that I've done in the past week, especially around equity, because equity and respectful care is kind of a, I don't want to say a newer topic. We should have always been talking about this, but in the last couple of years have become, has become a much more um, prominent discussion point for, especially for physicians. Like how do I practice respectful care? How do I offer that to my patients? What's the difference in populations? What's culturally competent versus culturally humble? And finding ways to communicate that is incredibly difficult. It's an incredibly challenging space, but it's something that's really important because they're the actual ones that are going to Put the policies that we're talking about into place are the ones that are actually going to be using our patient safety bundle for those pregnancy related complications and hopefully saving um, those minority birthing people from dying of those pregnancy related complications or those infants that are dying from those complications and um, I think ACOG puts in a lot of work on trying to figure out how, what's the best way to turn a lot of that social aspect and social surrounding social context into clinical evidence practice that doctors can understand and communicate with. And once doctors individually understand something, then it's about how do they communicate um, in the space with each other? Because when they start communicating with each other and they go out and then start interacting with the communities that they serve, that's when change actually starts happening and gets to be made and the cycle keeps going and going. And um, I'll jump in actually here because Garcy perfectly led into kind of what we're doing here in North Carolina with our maternal health innovation program. Um, so 
MHI, which we call the shorthand, is a giant program, statewide, uh, federally funded program. And in North Carolina, we have many different kind of uh, many fronts that we're fighting um, against, you know, uh, um, wanting to come change the tide in maternal health outcomes in North Carolina. And so one of those, like an integral part of our program is our work with what we call our champions group. Um, so North Carolina has six perinatal care regions. Um, so it just means that the state is broken up into, uh, uh, which is made up of 100 counties. Those counties are broken up into six perinatal care regions. So regions that work together collaboratively to um, focus in on their perinatal system of care. And so each of our six perinatal care regions, we have a champion group assigned to them. Um, that is a four person uh, uh, Co a collaborative group that includes a perinatal nurse champion, an obstetric uh, champion, a family medicine champion, and a, and a newly added pediatric champion. And their whole purpose is to be able to disseminate um, uh, education and technical assistance to other providers, clinical providers in their perinatal care region. So our perinatal nurse champions do a lot of outreach to um, uh, provider clinics that provide prenatal care, do outreach to the birthing facilities to do some, you know, regional uh, um, risk appropriate care assessment through like the CDC locate. And a big component is training. So electronic fetal monitoring, spinning babies, um, you know, uh, equity focused trainings, as well as then providing technical assistance for issues that arise um, that, you know, there needs to be some kind of physician to physician, nurse to nurse, nurse to physician consultation about. Um, and so that has made it easier for us at the state because a lot of the conversations that we're having with our champion groups, a group which happens at a statewide level monthly, we're focusing in on elevating some of the conversations around equity um, and um, some of that may look like uh, you know, recently we've had a lot of our champions integrated in kind of moving forward this effort in North Carolina to um, expand uh, med uh, pregnancy Medicaid for full, full 12 months. And so that's actually passed as of April 1st in North Carolina. Any um, woman or birthing person that's on pregnancy Medicaid now has full Medicaid for 12 months. So they can be seen for anything, even if it's not related to their pregnancy or, or, or birth. Um, so that was a huge, um, that was a huge uh, accomplishment in North Carolina, which still on the brink of expanding Medicaid, that is still a fight in North Carolina, that all of our physician champion groups are uh, deeply, um, physician and nurse champion groups are deeply committed to. I think, you know, because North Carolina is such a rural state um, and because the way that we engage these champions to be like-minded in, in understanding the social determinants of health, um, and then them taking that information into their communities and having, you know, that, yeah, uh, breaking that barrier, like uh, Garcy mentioned of like what's lost in translation when you have a clinician speaking to a clinician versus, you know, a public health is like, I like, I like to call ourselves, trying to speak to a physician is not always as clear. So we're, I do think we're, um, we have one up in that we're able to uh, utilize our champion groups to kind of be that mouthpiece um, to be able to, uh, advocate for um, minority folks within our state, um, underrepresented populations, you know, our rural folks that are experiencing hospital closures and things like that. Doesn't mean it's a utopia, but I do think that has been a good tool in our toolbox um, there. And I know Ushima, we're on the same team, so if you have anything to add, <laughs> Ushima, I don't want to take away from it. <laughs> So Rebecca, you have, as always, covered it um, pretty well. I guess I do want to add I personally do not have as much interaction as Rebecca and our other teammate Lily do with clinicians. Um, but the way that I support clinicians to inform, we are our number three, right? Like um, to inform practice and policy is to provide them the data that they need to, um, you know, inform these changes. And so, so data on maternal health indicators like maternal mortality, severe maternal, maternal morbidity, um, prenatal care access and um, birth weight, um, you know, and specifically for their area so that they can share that information with other clinicians um, that they work with and kind of emphasize the importance of the work that they are doing and the changes that they're trying to make. 
I challenge any of the attendees if they're they're if they like to live on the wild side, uh, join a nonprofit that uh, you know most people think uh, are you are you healthcare or not? Are you a, a nutrition or are you uh, you know what what are you basically? And you know that's what I've been struggling with since the 1980s till now. It, it's that we're a nonprofit. Um, mothers get us. Um, family um, people, you know, get us what we do, you know, try to help moms to uh, get through that initial process of having your baby fed and, um, and still struggle to get your milk in. Um, so yes, yes. <laughs> As a nurse, we did, I do a lot and still do even to this day, a lot of work with um, physicians just to go from ick, that sounds terrible, uh, to, yeah, I, I need it for my NICU. Um, and then also uh, talking to the FDA and the CDC and that state health department to get coverage for donor milk, which we were able to do um, early on. Um, yes, we as a, you know, as an offshoot, uh, I call us healthcare, but some you know, the, the nomenclature of milk banks in the FDA is, is nutrition, we're a food. But in California, we are licensed as a tissue bank, very similar to blood and uh, bone, eye banks and liver. So it, we're kind of a schizophrenic kind of <laughs> a situation. But I think the other thing just recently at milk banks, because we've been so limited in the scope of how we're being used nationally, we're now looking at, you know, who is using uh, donor milk. And uh, coming out next month, there's a study in collaboration with Stanford University that will be coming out to show the impact of donor milk in hospitals that are traditionally of, um, the of color basically and uh, that will be coming out soon and I think the milk banks are beginning to look at what is our impact nationally is it just for hospitals that are predominantly white or are, are we servicing families and uh, children of color so that's our big to do this coming year thank you for that and I'd be looking forward to reading that um, research. Um, so along with that, you all mentioned a lot about equity. So that was a great segue into my next question. Um, how does your work address maternal health inequities in communities of color? Well, I can um, start um, particularly with what's going on in North Carolina with the Maternal Health Innovation Program. Um, we definitely, I would say that, you know, we pride ourselves on a major part of our program being focused in on addressing um, health equity, racial equity when it comes to providing or improving care in order to improve um, outcomes. Uh, we have definitely within the last year focused in on our engagement with the North Carolina Area Health Education Center networks. Um, we see them as a huge partner in our, um, you know, in, in addressing some of the issues we have around uh, racial disparities in the state, um, but really thinking of it um, at a uh, kind of an upstream approach. So we've engaged with our AHEC Scholars Program to kind of promote public uh, uh, maternal health uh, as, a, as a career track for um, minority students that are currently in college so kind of like panel being part of panels like this and kind of promoting that we do value you do recognize congruent care being a strategy against you know the, the research supports that in many ways um, but the most exciting thing we've got going on which I've been so excited by this development is um so, so previously in the beginning of our program we did what a lot of I think other organizations are doing is you know do, promoting implicit bias training and particularly promoting an implicit bias training focused in on maternal health. And, you know, I'm definitely a proponent of we've gotten to a point with a lot of our uh, social uh, historically based ism based issues. <laughs> 
um, where we're, we're, we're beyond awareness, right? Like we've gotten to a point where being aware isn't enough and, and one training is not going to make the impact on the outcomes that we needed to, to do. Um, and so that was what we were doing for the first couple of years of the program. And we've decided to pivot um, and kind of think through, you know, the fact that we have limited resources, which that's the biggest thing in, in public health <laughs> is always having limited resources, but how can we maximize what we're doing? Um, and so we engage with one of our um, AHEX here in the state that has a good relationship with one of the large um, medical schools within our state. And we just had a conversation that turned into uh, a new contract to, to be able to provide reproductive justice center training to medical students, midwifery students, and nursing students to kind of kind of plant a seed early on into their career to start questioning the ways in which we practice care, we practice care in rural settings, we practice how we practice care to minority populations and be able to not only recognize the bias, but also root it out. Um, so a part of the education that we are receiving is some didactic, hands-on, simulation-like trainings related to reproductive justice. So we got a bigger bang for our buck than we, even, we could have even imagined. And that was just kind of by talking to people and seeing what resources we have available to us and that there's a hunger for doing things differently, for not every single year we're talking about what our infant mortality rates are, what our maternal mortality rates mm -hmm. are, what our severe maternal morbidity. People are interested in what does equity look like in practice and not just the implicit bias training. So that's kind of where my mind immediately went and super excited for the future with that. And, um, you know, in many different ways and in many different places across our, our program, we are addressing equity. Um, but I think this is kind of the most at hand and pertinent portion of how our innovation has evolved um, that aligns with the program, so. I know for accurate aim, one of the things that I implemented when I got the job was born out of my thesis work when I was doing work with ML TV, Medical Legal Partnership Boston. They wanted part of my thesis to be like a program evaluation of their SDOH trainings. And what um, all the Black Women Health and Human Services workforce members had told me was that they felt like there was a history piece missing to that SDOH. Um, how did we get to those negative experiences of social determinants of health in Boston? So I thought, okay, that means there's, um, and I, the CEO of OMP could be put it in a really big way. It was, there's a, a lack of intersectional history that's being taught at the academic level in the United States, like history that should be taught at the elementary and middle school levels or secondary levels now has to be taught at the professional levels and professionals do not have the time to kind of teach 200 years or thousands of years of world global history in a two hour training session and implicit bias or transportation or whatever. So how do you do that? And so we realized when we were doing respectful care with aim, but how do we kind of put that into space? So we kind of, I call it a historical competency training is what I titled it. But um, we are developing a series of three AIM modules at AIM. The first one is race and equity in obstetrics and gynecology. So what is race? What is equity? Why are we talking about it? Why is it important now? Why is it important in the maternal child health space? And then the second one is historical foundations of um, obstetrics and gynecology. A lot of OBGYNs don't know the background around Dr. James Marion Sims and that we have a lot of monogynecological practices based on the bodies of enslaved people and poor immigrants. Um, and so kind of providing that history and how, you know, we talk about history impacts the present and the future. And then the last e module is respectful care in obstetrics and gynecology. Like Rebecca said, we're trying to move past in this space, just acknowledging our implicit biases, acknowledging our mindsets and whatnot. We're trying to move past that into actual practice. So how do you put it into, how do you put respectful care into your practice? How do you start talking to your uh, fellow clinicians about it? Um, how do you actually go about communicating with your patient, actually going through the cycle of respectful care? And so those new modules are like my biggest project, I think, that I'm really proud of the work that we've done at AIM um, in the last two years. They're almost done hopefully in the next month, I keep saying next month and then another month comes and we have to do more work on it. But um, um, that I think is kind of the biggest part of my research that I think was really important is like, how do we, how do we start talking more about history? How do we start acknowledging those individual populations um, and history that we don't really talk about in the United States? I think uh, the United States has been really unique in how we address our history. Um, you think of like the Holocaust in Germany, 
they are very, very aware of their history. They constantly talk about it. It's talked about in schools. They have museums. Certain things are outlawed. There's hate speech. And we don't have that same approach in the United States. In fact, we try to make a lot of our history invisible or, you know, it's 250 years ago. We don't really need to talk about it anymore. And so history is a big part of how I think we tackle um, not only just racial and ethnic health disparities, but how we talk about different marginalized populations in the United States. Yeah, one of the things that our AA and HPI um, collab in California have done is we found money to um, support uh, people who would like to go into the lactation field that um, speak a, a unique language or a specific language in the Asian population. Um, so we found money. We want to train as many lactation consultants as possible um, to speak you know, the languages. And I think the other thing that we're doing um, <clears throat> is developing a resource. Uh, so for example, a, a small population of um, Chamorro in um, LA, that if they need help and they're in Northern California, we can connect um, lactation consultants uh, throughout the state. Um, and the other thing that we're doing, which is a lot of fun for me because I'm third generation Japanese American. I do not speak Japanese nor any other Asian <laughs> languages, but the ability to, to share stories and to share what they know culturally that is of benefit to their child and their health during this short period of time is so important and we wanna honor as Ushma was saying, we want to honor the the uh, native foods and the you know and and the um, cultural um, aspects of birthing, um, and to impart that information to the um, maternal and child group in California. So um, it is all volunteer work uh, right now. So. It's a long task, but it's impressive if you think that, you know, we've got what um, so many different cultures and languages that we have to address. But it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge, but it's a lot of fun. Um, I don't really have anything to add. I think Rebecca really covered everything for MHI. Okay, that's fine. Um, we're actually running up on time already. We have about 12 minutes left. So I'm not sure if we'll be able to get to all of the questions, but I did want to ask, um, what are the biggest challenges you have faced in your work or research in maternal health? Well, I can name a few. Oh, sorry, Pauline, did you want to go? No, go ahead, go ahead. Um, a traditional lack of focus or care on maternal health issues and the associated lack of funding because of that. The incredibly slow pace of policy change can be um, dispiriting. <laughs> uh, and more recently, the lack of trust in the public health system and the active undermining of it. Um, I would also say that there's a disconnect between maternal health program priorities and actual, you know, practices in the public health workplace. So, you know, we are also advocating for support and flexibility in the workplace as mothers and um, fathers, even though we ourselves are public health workers, you know, th those are all issues we all face. Mm -hmm. I, I would also suggest, oh, sorry, yes, I would also, I think those are valuable. I also think that um, one of the biggest challenges that I face is, is advocacy. And as much as I, you know, as you know, that I do a lot of advocacy, whether it's human milk and donor milk banking and the Asian Pacific Islanders group, um, it's to draw, um, the hardest part is to draw the energy out of the population 
and to the public health groups and to the clinical groups as well to, to advocate, to, to see and to use not just data, but to take your everyday experiences and um, try to address those issues in this, in this uh, huge system. I think it's the hardest. I think um, in the work that I do, the challenge is how often, because we're kind of, this is newly being talked about, how often this field is changing on equity and respectful care in maternal child health. It's, we're still learning. It's still pretty new, um, the research around it. And like I said, some populations that really need to be looked at are still pretty invisible in this space. Um, and so kind of figuring out ways to reach out to those populations, figure out how to do the research and then turn that research into actionable implementation is really hard um, because a lot of this is kind of nebulous and abstract, um, although the consequences are very real and very um, and felt um, in very high numbers, but the concept is still abstract and so turning it into actionable implementation is incredibly challenging. So not much to add. I think what everyone said is spot on. I would just add um, what we've experienced in North Carolina. It's just not, it goes back to kind of what Ushma shared about the resources. The resources aren't there necessarily for maternal health, um, particularly maternal health data and how that's collected and the quality of that data and the efforts needed to put in to get the quality maternal health data um, isn't necessarily, you know, we, we, we don't put our money where our mouth is, right? We talk about families, we talk about, you know, women and birthing people and, you know, uh, the the health of a nation is based on the health of their, their the children, of the infants and, and, and um, birthing people within their country. But we also, you know, are one of the, I think one of two countries in the world that we do not have a uh, um, uh, paid uh, paternity leave, right? The universal paid paternity leave, which is, outrageous but that's just kind of what we've all accepted and unfortunately um I, well I won't say what we've all accepted that's just been the way things have done but we are actively pushing against that um and we just need more um bright folks within maternal health even the non-clinical space to keep pushing um us forward into getting to a point where we are valuing we are putting our money where our mouth is and valuing um some of the most vulnerable people in our population Thank you all. Um, we're running on the last couple minutes. Um, if you all have any quick advice for any students, it doesn't seem that there are any questions in the chat box. So um, with these last two minutes, if you all have any advice, just some quick advice, and then we will adjourn from there. I'm sure I have one quick piece of advice. Um, I would say realize what makes you tick. You know, For me, it's knowing that I'm working to make a difference in maternal health at a broad level. Um, so that keeps me where I am um, working for, a, you know, the betterment. Mm -hmm. My advice is um, based on everybody's story here, there's not one path to get into maternal child health at public health. We all ended up here. I was completely by accident. So I think like Isha said, find what makes you tick. And I am pretty sure it will lead you into the space that you're meant to be in. Um, and if your passion is maternal child health, you will find a place in this world. And we need more people um, like that in the maternal child health space. So don't worry, you will, you will find something. Um, I would say definitely get connected to um, a lot of the maternal health focused organizations if you're interested. Um, a lot of them have social media presence. I would say keep studying and keep reading. I, th I think I've done more reading outside of my college experience than I did inside of it. You know, there's we all touched a bit on the historical um, implications. And so familiarizing yourself with all the different types of um, uh, intersecting identities in the United States and start digging into that history because um, it's something that's not on a silver platter for us. We got to go looking for it. Um, my, what I'd like to say is think big, think the future, um, 
MCH is what it is today on the backs of a lot of people that put it together. But my advice is to think big, think about the future, think about the next generation and uh, you will find your space. There's always space at the table in maternal and child health. Um, and we always are looking for new ideas. So good luck. And I'm hoping that, that we get to a place in the US where our maternity, morbidity and mortality is stellar and that every mother is breastfeeding. So I don't have to keep doing milk banking anymore. <laughs> That's my goal. So think big. <laughs> well, thank you all for attending and thank you panelists for sharing your stories and experiences. We're actually out of time. Um, so thank you again. And if any of the attendees wanted to contact the panelists, um, I'm sure the panelists would be happy to answer any questions after. Um, the time went by so fast, I thought we would have a lot more time than we actually did. Um, but thank you again for your time and um, taking time out of your schedule to attend this session. And I hope you got something out of it. All right. Well, thank you. And Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Nice thank meeting you. all of you. <laughs> Likewise.